of them. We've got our choir director here. Number <laughs> 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 77. Oh, waiting no danger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the Living, you know, uh, out in 
out west there where they're having all those floods. And you know, Pastor Joe Larson, uh, he's the guy you hear with, with me every Monday. Joe used to be, uh, we did a morning radio program together for years. Okay? He was my co-host. But uh, he has a ranch out in Missouri, oh. and he's, he's on an island. He has, where he's at now, uh, the water rose so high that he had to park his, uh, his truck miles from where he lives. Wow. And he, he can't, he was in there where he couldn't leave, couldn't come out. He was just uh, totally isolated. He's up on the only high place there. So, and if it keeps on, they keep, the levees keep breaking and that, the water keeps rising. It's the old Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember a few years back what happened? When you had a lot of rain, it all came, the Mississippi ran backwards. Oh, yeah. It only happened a couple times, yeah. But I say all that because I, I mean, I get caught up in that too, complaining, you know. Oh. And uh, so, you know, I say that to not, so we don't complain about, you know, the Lord has blessed us here, you know. We, oh, yeah. we can wake up and we don't have to worry about our houses being blown away. And, you know, we've been very blessed in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have been. Because we know what it's like to get flooded. We've been, well, I've been flooded before. Mm. It's, it's bad. It's not a lot of fun. Mm. I think we'll be blessed. I mean, no matter, even in bad times, the worst, the worst is still, a, it's a blessing. Yeah. But we have it good. I have it good. Yeah, well, they always we say, love. whenever you start feeling sorry for yourself, just think of that. There's about a billion people out there that would trade places with you. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Real heartbeat. So. Yeah, I think of the, yeah. Think of the people in India that has to go out hunting rats just to eat to stay alive. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 And I'm thankful that really that it did get cold again because we really do need cold weather. Yes. The plants have been really. I saw a sand cherry the other day blooming. That's not good. You said you've seen something too on the radio, didn't you? Yeah, we had daddy lines going yeah, around. Yeah, that's, that's common. But sand cherry? Yeah, well, you know, in Washington, D.C., all the cherry uh, blossoms were blooming. You know what that means? That means they have a freeze boom, no no cherries. Yeah, it's I mean, this, we need cold weather now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a little strange for us, isn't it? Yeah. It's just strange everywhere in the weather. But I'm yeah. just thankful that God still has everything under control. Yeah. No matter what happens to us, even if it means death, we got right. we got That's right. victory. <laughs> yes, That's right. amen. That's amen. Nothing can be because destroyed. the scriptures say in Ephesians that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavens in Christ. That far outweighs the temporal blessings. Yes. That's Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Do you know what that means? Blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavens in Christ. Exactly. What well, he's, what's the first spiritual blessing you can receive? Salvation. salvation. You see, you don't receive the others until you receive that. That's salvation. You know what he's in Christ. Yeah. Do you know what he's saying there, though? He's telling you that your salvation is kept in heaven. It's not kept if it was if we kept it. We'd lose it. Our <laughs> yeah. All you have to do. That's about our That's, thank God. Yeah. We got an intercessor Jesus Christ praying for us. Too. Yeah, well, you see, I, I remember listening to a Pentecostal preacher one day, and he was saying that, that uh, Jesus finished, he sat down, now it's all the Holy Ghost. Well, if that were true, we'd be in more trouble than you could imagine, because we wouldn't have that intercessor intercessor for us continuously. So, yeah. What, what are the, this is some, yeah, yeah. Well, the more the Lord blesses, and, and obviously the, there are constant reminders of this, especially in the Old Testament, where the he blessed the Judas and the more he blessed them, the more they took things for granted and wanted to do things on their own. But but especially in this country, because this country has been so blessed, we have a tendency to complain about little things. But this was, I don't know, several years ago, I was watching a Christian program on TV. And there was this little girl, I don't know whether it was India or Africa, but she was she was living in a, I think a cardboard box or something. 
and she had committed her life to the Lord, and she's sitting there with rags on and putting nothing to live in. And she was just praising God and saying, I have everything. And if that, if that didn't touch you, to see what that little girl had practically nothing, and she was thanking God so beautifully for, for how He had blessed her and just met, met all of her needs. And, and you know, when, that's what I'm saying. When, because we've got so much. If we miss something or something happens, what do we do? We start complaining. Well, you know, we have an obligation to as God has blessed us to be a blessing to those. Yes, exactly. And I just wish, you know, that uh, uh, the problem of it is if they were like here, right here, we would we could help them. But you don't know, you never know when you give to so many of these charities. You really got to check them out because yeah, there's yeah. so many of them. I gave a list out, and I think I should yeah. put that in the yeah. mailing of yeah, that those the newspaper uh, or the those uh, where the money the actually water. goes to the person. You right. know, uh, there are some like. <coughs> For example, Salvation Army, all of it, you know, goes to the people. But when you get to, like, the Red Cross, the Red Cross is a... Uh, Goodwill, you said, is another one. Yeah, Goodwill is, is a for-profit organization. Yeah. They're not a non-profit organization. People don't realize that, but one of the worst is UNICEF. The, the, oh, yeah. The guy that directs, the director of UNICEF, makes two million something a year. And he gets a Rolls Royce to drive, and only five cents on the dollar actually goes to the kids. Five cents on the dollar. But, um, like the disabled veterans, 100% goes to them. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others where, oh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, 100%. Uh, the ones you definitely don't want to give it to uh, is, uh, oh, what is the, uh, the big one that collects the well, United, United Way. Way. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, you don't want to give it to United Way. And I, well, I have a listing of all of them that breaks it right down to, you know, to how much everyone gets. You can put that in the newsletter. Yeah, I should do that. Yeah. Because we are held responsible for what we do at Dr. Resource. Absolutely, we are. Jay Vern McGee gave us a sermon on that one. You know, teaching. But that's true. God blesses us, and we need to make sure the money goes to those who can help. It. See, when I, we said to missionaries that we know, and it's the same thing like when I tell you folks, don't give to National Right to Life or don't give to Ohio Right to Life. Give it directly to your local chapter because they've sold us out. They've sold us out. I was on the board of Ohio Right to Life for 21 years, and until all the facilitators came in, the opposition. They come in, they're parasitical. They come in from within. And they're patient. They will work there and they will look like they're so dedicated and they'll even, they'll even eat some of their own just to, sh to prove that they're with you. And then the first opportunities they get, they start destroying the organization from within. And so I wouldn't give a dime to Ohio right to that. Give, it to, you. give it to your local chapter. That's evil. I know that's yeah. evil. That's exactly that's what happens. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's exactly how yeah. that works. Yeah. And you know, there's there's hundreds of nonprofit organizations helping people, but most of them's really a business because they they really don't want to cure or solve the problem they're working with. They're they're out of a job. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's what happened with Ohio and National Right to Life. They don't want to. Yeah. See, when we were when I was there, there was no paid positions until the very end. That's when the facilitators. Now the director makes a good salary. In fact, not only does he, he he's getting like five different paychecks with different government jobs, okay? and he's working. He, he's in with the Senate or with the Kasich. Mm -hmm. They don't want to stop abortion. Mm -hmm. Kasich is the one that's kept us from getting the heartbeat bill passed. He ran as right. And see, here's the thing. Uh, when I said that the worst was United Way, I was wrong. The worst is Planned Parenthood by oh, far. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're a non-profit, but they're the most wicked, evil organization yeah. in the world. I'm the only person I know that have been for 40 years telling people how bad they are. For 40 years I've been telling people how wicked they are. I never knew how bad until I started listening to <laughs> yeah. That's well, I learned. I can go. All the yeah, stuff I, that we were telling you years ago is coming out now. 
I can try to hear it. And if you don't, you just don't really think much of it. I never really thought years ago about a whole lot about abortion. Now I, I, it's horrifying. It's just not. It is. It's, you know, it's, it's and killing the, no matter what. The wickedness that you have. I have an article in my briefcase by this wicked horror woman. She is. She runs. She's an abortionist, and she says that she loves killing babies. She, she, she loves killing babies uh, because she learned to do that in her Christian faith. This is how oh, we get in the Yeah, psychopathic killer. She said she, uh, she does not do <coughs> than killing babies. This well, the thing her. is they lie. They lie to you, and um, they're going to be accountable to God because people that go there for help really want help, and they and they lie to you. Oh yeah, I know. And then you know you don't know that. Your, well, some of the girls, girls don't know that, and then later on they find out. And then well, that's the case sometimes. But some of the cases you just have. We live in a time of Second Timothy chapter three, because I'm out there on the streets all the time. Some of these girls coming in there, they are wicked, evil, evil. I had one tell me. I've already killed six babies, this will be the seventh. I've got the right to do that, wow. okay? Uh, and they, they just go a whoring. They're out there. I had one, uh, she was a stripper, a blonde stripper, and she came in with three guys. And I said, <laughs> I said, what are, you, what are all three of you doing here? She said, and uh, they said, well, we're not sure which one is of the father, so we're all going to pay some. I said, let me tell you guys something. Pay close attention, boys. You're all fools. Probably none of you are. Yes. Okay, but you see, she's going to commit a horrible offense against God, and you fools are going to be in there with you. You're going to be blood guilty. Yes. And these guys, they looked at each other and they said, yeah, you know, he may be right. <laughs> and they said, we're not going to do it. So they went up and told her, listen, we don't want no part of this, okay? Oh, God, so they weren't thinking about the baby, they were thinking about their own yep. greedy selves, okay? And that's how people are, you know, so many yeah. times. And anyhow, you ought to have seen her when they left her there. They took, she was a screaming bad oh, she. Sure. She stood in the doorway and cussed and screamed at me, okay? Mm. But th there's, there's a very a coldness out there today. Uh, and then on the other side of it, there's some, it's, it's different. I remember, like that song I sing, The Preacher, on a cold winter yeah. evening. That's a true story. That happened. That woman came out all the way down the sidewalk. I could see it. it was like a darkness around here. It was early. It was still dark out. And it was snowing up a storm out there. And that woman got on her knees in the snow on the sidewalk and asked the Lord into her heart. Wow, praise God. And uh, her baby was Adam. In fact, I got a, I got a picture of him in my I briefcase. I telling that story, yeah. And there's some that's like uh, another one. We had uh, a young woman, they came in there, and as they came by me, she was crying. And uh, I looked at her, and she, she had tears coming down, and she had a black eye. This guy had punched her out. She was a pretty woman, you know, very. And he punched her out. So I walked over to the truck. It was in a pickup truck. And I said, uh, listen, I said, I'm here to help you. You don't have to. This guy says, you, this, you know, get the blanket and blank away, or I'm going to get it. I said, son, I said, there's nothing between us but air in your mouth. I said, we can change that right now. So if you want to come out here and impress me, and they see, I'm not a woman. So with this, he just took out as fast as he could get out of there. Okay? And uh, guess what? It was a couple of us. Well, it was about, about two years later, this woman comes out, and she stopped, and she said, are you Pastor Sanders? And I said, yes. Yeah. I've been looking all over for you. And she said, my sister asked me to stop and find you. Here's a picture of her. Here's a picture of the baby. She oh. was the woman, and I remember. And she got rid of that bump. <laughs> and she's got a son that she loves, and she wanted me to tell you thank you wow. for being out there. Awesome. Wow. That's great. So, yeah, you have these these cases there. Um, mm. Sometimes what you have to actually do is get them so angry at you that they'll come out to talk and they'll do that. Then you have a chance of getting them the gospel. God's word does not return void. No. And uh, I had this one who was a bodybuilder. He was going to come down and uh, he was going to whoop on me. And so uh, he come down there. Huh? 
can't beat God. No. And uh, so, I mean, I just kind of got a hold of him, you know. Same thing, you know, he had a lot of wolf in the puffin. But I gave him the word of God, and I told him what he was facing, and I preached to him about heaven and hell. And uh, he actually came back three years later, brought the little girl, stopped him, looked me up, and said, I want to thank you again for getting a hold of me and, and giving me the whooping. Okay, but he said, if you hadn't, I, I would have killed her. So okay. when are you going to write your book? <laughs> People have been, you know, I'd like to do that if I ever had the time. I figured, I Good figured reason. by this time, Obama would have had me in jail and I'd had time to write it. <laughs> <laughs> like all, huh? Yeah, yes. yeah, because, you know, there's a lot of them who don't want me there in the worst way. <laughs> yeah. That'd be very inspiring yeah. to hear those testimonies. Well, be interesting. we had, yeah. we had one of this fella, Bill, his sister ran the book, the abortion mill over at Severance. I think I told you about him before. He was six foot eight, weighed about 400 pounds. She hired him to get rid of me. And he would come out, he would just stand there and go like this and he would growl, okay? <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I used to sing that song to You heard about the jolly green giant, Willie. And I sang this song. <laughs> and, uh, I sang this song. Now Willie's no prize, and there's no women his size. <laughs> That's why Willie's so mean. Yeah, and I would do. So, and he would growl. You know, I mean, so, yeah. So then, one day, one day, I come out there, and he's standing there. And he's got this real, he just looked pitiful. He's a great big man, just, he looked like he just was about to cry. And I said, hey, Willie, what do you want? I said, come over here. Why? I said, I want to say something really nice to you. <laughs> oh, i got to hear this. <laughs> so he, he says, what is it? I said, here it is, okay. I said, I don't ever, no, not never, no, not ever, ever, ever want you to go to hell. I don't. Mm. Why not? I said, because I know what hell is all about. Mm -hmm. wow. I said, do you? He said, no. I said, do you want to know? Said, yeah. And I told him. I explained to him what the Bible said about where the worm never dieth with mm -hmm. his gnashing of teeth. And I took him over and I showed him in Matthew 23 where it says some mm -hmm. there, the punishment would be greater. Okay, they used, he used the word damnation instead of condemnation, a stronger term there. And, uh, and I said, Willie, I said, it's a horrible, it never ends. It's a, a horrible, horrible uh, existence where the smoke of your torment rises yeah. forever. Yeah. And uh, he said, what do I do? Oh. I said, you got to repent. Are you going to burn? I said, you got to learn not to burn. Okay. So I don't know how to do that. That's what I do. Well, show me. So he said the sinner's Aww. prayer. We had him. Wow. He took my hand, that great big man, and he said the Praise sinner's him. prayer. And he had tears coming down his face. Oh, he went in, uh, he said, I'll be right back. And I thought, oh, he's going to go up there and turn that place apart now. <laughs> and uh, he went He went up there and he came back and uh, he said, I just told my sister I'd never stand against you again. He said, but Pastor, I can't stand against my sister. You understand. Well, his son ended up being a Baptist preacher. Wow. wow. And, yeah, he got built. Yeah, he was saved. And, and uh, Unfortunately, he died uh, about five years after that. But uh, mm. yeah, that was something. I have a bunch of stories, boy, because I've been on those streets for over forty years. I wow. went, went through a lot of pairs of boots on those streets. <laughs> but anyhow, um, Coach, could you get me a bottle of water? Sure. It's in that fridge, and we'll get into the message tonight. And. We'll be starting in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 tonight. Thanks, Coach. You're welcome. And I've never known a time in all of my life when there has been such fear, apprehension among the body of Christ, the church, as there is today. Ever since abomination 
the dark prince, the man of great sin, arose to power. Uh, the status of America has continued to ever decline. Now, when I was a young man, people for the most part felt that there was something very, very special about being American. America was the envy of the entire world, uh, the greatest nation that ever existed. America was above all nations, truly blessed of God. America was the wealthiest, the most powerful, uh, the most generous, and above all, one nation under God, indivisible, with justice, with real justice and liberty for all. America, until recent years, was the greatest creditor nation. We didn't know anybody anything. After World War II, we helped every nation. Uh, we helped our enemies and our allies alike rebuild. On our dollar bill, the words, in God we trust, were believed. They were really believed and honored by most of us. We enjoyed the privilege of living in the freest nation on earth. America was good, America was healthy, America was clean and great. America today is sick, wounded, bleeding, and dying. What has brought the greatest nation that the world has ever known to its knees? It wasn't from any foreign power, no. Not at all. Not from no nuclear country. No, the enemy was from within. And we start tonight in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Today we have a whole lot of people, too many people, that are professing Christians, uh, and they're professing Christians as long as they can stay comfortable. I cannot tell you how many prissy preachers in my lifetime have told me, you know, I'm just not, I'm just not comfortable with doing that, being in the pro-life, going out and saving babies. I'm just not comfortable uh, for it going down and preaching down in Columbus to these senators and state representatives when they offer up legislation <coughs> that's anti-God, anti-America, okay? I'm just not. When you say, you won't find one place in God's Word, the Bible, where it says they're supposed to be comfortable. But you can find a whole lot of places to make it clear they're not supposed to be comfortable. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall we? the end of them that obey not the gospel of God. God's judging the church today, folks. Yeah. He's judging the church. And, and I'll tell you what else he's doing. He's purifying it. He's taking his people out, all those apostate churches out there today. I mean, it's really gotten bad out there, the apostasy. Oh, yeah. Now listen, this next verse, this next verse should make people tremble. Uh, Chrissy Matthew said Obama gave him a, a thrill up his leg, okay? Uh, you know what? This should, this should send shivers, this next verse, up most people's legs. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous scarcely be saved, folks. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God permit the keeping of their souls to him as well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness in the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. You see, an elder or pastor, by the way, you know, a lot of people don't realize that you have the, this hierarchy you have out there that they've made, this man-made hierarchy. Uh, the ways of the Nicolaitans, where clergy will elevate themselves. And it's an interesting thing if you go into some of, of these uh, Protestant churches. And by the way, we are not Protestant, we're Baptists, there's a big difference. But especially in some of the Lutheran churches, and that, uh, they will have three pulpits. You will actually have three pulpits. They have one pulpit on the floor level, and that's for people there in the church, lay people. They'll have another pulpit, usually for uh, a visiting pastor. And if a visiting pastor comes, uh, it'll be elevated a little higher. And then they'll have the third, the highest, 
pulpit, and that'll be for the senior pastor or for uh, a bishop or something from another congregation that will come. Somebody who's a leader in the church. Well, folks, a bishop, an elder, a pastor, a presbytery, they're all the same office. It's all the same. Same, same office, different names for the same office. A lot of people get very confused with that. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Take the oversight thereof, not by constraint willingly, but for filthy lucre, but a remedy of mine. He's telling you to feed them the word of God. It's yeah. on the word, teach them the word of God. That's what he's mm -hmm. telling you. Neither as being lords over God, or God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. God will always, always, always keep his commitment. And when he said that, he will do that. He always has, he always will. Now, here, I remember I had a friend who was a pastor, and I didn't realize one day uh, the way that he ran things in his congregation. Um, I had some people came that wanted to volunteer to do some work in the pro-life ministry. So I said, well, I said, here's some th areas where we could use some help. And he said, well, I have to go ask my pastor to make sure uh, he says it's okay. It was a husband and wife. And that same fellow at one time actually sat on the board of Ohio Right to Life with me. There were, when I was first on there, out of about 70 people, there were four of us that were kept. Okay? Myself, two other pastors, um, and uh, a lady uh, who moved to Texas. She was a, the secretary down there. But all the rest were Catholics at that time. When I left, it was about half and half. But it was an interesting thing, uh, because when I was talking to these people, uh, they said, we don't ever, ever do anything without getting our pastor's permission. And uh, I said, what do you mean? They said, well, like, if we buy a car, for example, he will tell us <coughs> And I said, really? Yeah. And as far as having children, we wait till pastor says we're ready, and when he says we can have children, we can have children. I says, uh, and I said, there's, there's something very wrong there. No, you can't have Can it. I have a children? I just had a granddaughter. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Anyhow. First one. So, wow. Praise the good Lord for that. Amen. Anyhow, so, see, that is out of his realm of authority. You know, the pastor has a realm of authority, but... The realm of authority as far as that, that's that's the, the husband, that's the father who decides that, okay, not the pastor of the church. When it comes to what kind of a car you buy or where you can live, that's out of that pastor's realm of authority. And there are some like that, well, like it says here, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Pastors are supposed to lead by example. A shepherd leads the flock. He's out in front. If there's danger out there, he's the one that faces it, okay? And he never asks his people to do anything that he wouldn't do. In all of my years, I always led by example. I never <coughs> asked people to do anything that I wouldn't do. We went out there uh, when they told us, if you cannot preach out here on the sidewalk, we have something here called the Great Commission. That comes from God. And we obey God rather than man. Amen. And I was the first one to be out there, the first one to be arrested. But I obey God rather than a corrupt judicial system or a corrupt society. Okay? Amen. And we always will obey God rather than man. Amen? <coughs> Amen. And so, if you turn over to Second Thessalonians, <coughs> God doesn't take kindly uh, for the world to touch his people and come after his people. And God's got a very, very good and long memory. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or chapter 1, starting with verse 5, we read this. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, well, let me just give you an example, and Kevin knows uh, here with me, just uh, 
about what two years ago. Well, when I was arrested, when they arrested me for singing, "Don't fall into that burning lake of fire," okay, to those lesbians at the abortion mill, Planned Predators. Well, they called the police and charged me with terrifying them. I, I was in. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding you. They did. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, and so, <laughs> so they charged charged me with terrifying the lesbians. Well, they didn't haul you off to jail, but they stopped you and gave me a ticket, which is the same thing. Right. Well, I had to go to court. Yeah, and had to go to court. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Too bad you couldn't have sprinkled the The judge and the prosecutor both. A judge says, "Hey, listen," he said, uh, "You don't have to tell me about Planned Predators. They cost me a lot myself, but." but but both of them knew I didn't break any laws. We have a, a, a First Amendment right, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was singing my song that I wrote. Well, you want to hear a good one? It was Harry the, Abrams and Schulman was the prosecutor. Yeah. yeah. Schulman was the prosecutor and Abrams the judge. Well, both of these two, after they had uh, fined me, I had a court. I could have fought it and would have drug it out, but I didn't have, you know, I had too many other things to do, okay? But, uh, you know, I told them. I said, God don't like people touching his anointed. So, and they, right now they're both in prison. It was right after that, that they wow. both went down. They were running a whorehouse out of the hotel, the apartment buildings there, and laundering money. Okay. Wow. Yep. But, uh, but you want to hear? Not only that, the two cops that gave me the ticket. After they gave me a ticket, they said. Is there any way we could get one of your CDs? We love your song. <laughs> I said, are you clowns kidding me? He said, no, no, it, you know, if you wouldn't want to. So I gave him one. I gave him a CD. <laughs> Never had it. We don't have boring days. We don't. It's, it's strange, it seems like, but God's got a sense of humor. He really does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he says, and to you are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and a flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power and when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Amen. And you see, it means exactly what it says here. Exactly. And you see, again, the, you know, if the one thing that Satan can do, the one thing he wants to do more than anything, is to try to find a way to break the Word of God. He can't. Okay. But if he could, that would be the only thing that would keep him out of eternal hellfire. <coughs> and that's what he's tried to do time and time and time and time again. He tried to break the Word of God. And so, what made us such a great nation to begin with? Well, the Bible tells you that. It was faith in our Creator. Now, if you go to Psalms chapter 33 and verse 12, and in Psalms 33 and verse 12, we read this, just one verse. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for innocent inheritance. Now oh, we go to another one. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. But you see, again, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. America, there's two nations that were founded. One nation under God, Israel and the United States. And two nations that were blessed amongst all nations. Amongst all nations. And then what have we done? What do we, well, I can tell you what we do, what we've done. If you go right over to Psalms chapter 9, in Psalm chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, we read this. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. The wicked shall be turned into hell <coughs> all the nations that forget God. America has forgotten her God. America has forgotten her God. And that's what's happening to America today. And so, if you go over to 
Isaiah chapter 56. And the title of the message was, as we start out, Dumb Dogs, a Dull of Hearing, and Whited Sepulcher. And in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 9 through 12, I want to remind you, back in 1962, God was thrown out of the public school system. Yeah. The door was left open, <coughs> and the wrong guy came in. The other fellow came in. Yeah. Now, folks, let me tell you what should have happened. What should have happened then is the pastors in this country should have rose up. Yeah. They should have marched on Washington, D.C. They should have put that unclean entity that was supreme.